Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. Was it the barbarians who sapped the strength of the Roman Empire? Was it disease? Was it Christianity? Was it taxes that caused its decadence or was it just another ancient empire that could not adjust when circumstances changed too radically? The decline of Rome, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. In the 6th century, a Roman nobleman was dragooned into becoming Pope, which wasn't the most comfortable of jobs in those days. Eventually, that gentleman would be known as Gregory the Great, and he would be canonized as Saint Gregory. But by this time, there hadn't been an emperor living in Rome for nearly 200 years or one in Italy for 100. In fact, all the territory from Hadrian's Wall in Britain to the Adriatic Sea and beyond was now dominated by a number of backward warlike tribes, most of them German. The western part of the empire was no more. The emperor ruled in Constantinople, and though some of his ships and troops still held a few Italian ports, most of the peninsula was occupied by barbarians. Pope Gregory believed that the end of the world was near. After all, the empire was staggering to its end, so judgment day must be nigh. Gregory also thought that volcanoes were the gates of hell and that their mouths were growing larger in order to admit the increasing number of damned souls. Although Gregory was anxious to mitigate the suffering and still the turmoil around him, the main business of life in such circumstances was to prepare for death. In one of his sermons, Gregory looked back from the disorder and misery of his own age. Everywhere death, mourning, desolation, as he said in one of his sermons, to the material prosperity of earlier times when Christians were martyrs to their faith. In those days, the beginning of the second century when Trajan was emperor, there was long life and health, said Gregory, material prosperity, growth of population and the tranquility of daily peace. Yet, while the world was still flourishing in itself, in their hearts, it had already withered. You might call Gregory's description of better days sour grapes but it does raise the question of how a prosperous, lawful, advanced society gave way to darkness and to chaos. The first and obvious answer is that the Roman Empire of the second century was surrounded by darkness and chaos by a host of backward, hungry, savage tribes across the Tyne, the Rhine and the Danube rivers, not to mention the mountains and deserts of Asia and Africa. As long as these tribes were held in check, they mostly fought each other. 
individuals often trickled into the empire to look for work or sign on as mercenaries, and some of them settled as immigrants do today and became Romanized. But when they could, they burst through over the border to raid and loot and ravage as a tribe, and when the opportunity offered, Instead of turning back home with their plunder, they might even take over the better lands of the empire itself and settle there until someone else came and pushed them off. After 250 AD or thereabouts, this process accelerated. The raids became invasions and the emperors bent all their energies to stabilizing what was left and keeping the barbarians at bay, sometimes by hiring a group of barbarian mercenaries to fight on behalf of Rome. Better still, the Romans would try to persuade one tribe to fight another so that they would be too busy to threaten Rome. But around the year 214 before Christ, when the Chinese began to build a great wall to preserve their civilized world against barbarians, a federation of aggressive Mongol tribes had turned west. These were the people we call the Huns. As they traveled westward over the course of several centuries, the Huns pushed before them other warlike tribes, the Goths and the Vandals, who were desperate to get away from them, which tells you just how awful the Huns must have been. In the late 4th century, some of these fleeing peoples, notably the Goths, got into the Balkans, which were among the richest provinces of the empire, and from there into Italy. Then, Around the year 406, many more Vandals crossed the frozen Rhine and ravaged Gaul. As one contemporary observer remarked, Gaul smoked to heaven in one continuous pyre. And after Gaul was devastated, they crossed into Spain and North Africa. In due course, the Huns followed, carrying even worse destruction wherever they went. After that, the West was a chaos of frightened Roman survivors and brawling savage tribes. It's difficult to exaggerate the horror and suffering all this involved for generations. It wasn't war as we understand it, but robbery and mayhem on a vast scale exercised on an almost defenseless population rather like an endless raid by motorcycle gangs. It meant the sack of cities, the massacre and enslavement of populations, and the devastation of open country. Attila the Hun, who led his people for 20 years in mid-5th century, was known as the Scourge of God. In 448 in the Balkans, Roman envoys to Attila found the once populous city of Naissus empty except for corpses. In Africa a few years earlier, if a city refused to surrender, the Vandals would march their captives up to the walls and butcher them en masse so that the stench of their corpses should make defense untenable. As St. Jerome wrote in 396, the mind shudders when dwelling on the ruin of our day. On every side sorrow, lamentation, everywhere the image of death. By Pope Gregory's time in the 6th century, chaos and mayhem had become a part of normal life. So the question becomes, how did it happen? Why was Rome unable to defend itself? Edward Gibbon's great history, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, was published in London in the years between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. 
and it attributes much of the responsibility for Rome's decline to the insidious effects of Christianity, which Gibbon thought was bad for the Roman fiber. He calls it the triumph of superstition. But it's interesting that Gibbon's story runs from the end of the first century to the fifth century, which is a pretty long incubation period for a mortal illness, especially when you consider that Gibbon was writing just when the British Empire was about to rise. Today, two centuries after Gibbon, the British Empire is no more, whereas just the decline of Rome took four centuries. And unlike Gibbon, most present-day historians concentrate not on Christianity, but on social, economic, constitutional factors, which is reasonable because those can be traced and measured to some extent. So let's take a look at them. One of the most striking versions of the fall of Rome focuses on all the fertile soil, upland farms well-drained or irrigated areas passing over generations into the hands of landlords who cultivated them by slave labor. The poorer areas, especially the marshland, were left to the peasants. In these marshes, the malaria mosquito bred. The disease and the poverty that resulted drove the victims into the cities where they spread the infection and perhaps contributed to the feverish kind of city politics characteristic of Rome. Then, according to one theory, malaria, joined perhaps by smallpox or some other plague, moved outward to the frontiers of the empire, decimating the garrisons, depopulating the towns, eventually leading to the final breakthrough of the barbarians. If this theory is true, the Roman Empire was actually destroyed by a mosquito, which may not be so far-fetched if you consider that Alexander the Great had probably died of malaria. It has also been argued that short-sighted methods by farmers like this one exhausted the soil, impoverished smallholders, depopulated the countryside, and left little for the tax collector, hence little to pay the legions who were the protectors of the empire. According to another view, it was too heavy taxes that drove people off the land, and so the decay of agriculture was the result of tax burdens. Actually, both points are true, but neither is a sufficient explanation since soil exhaustion was not general. For instance, Gaul and Egypt were pretty lush. And while taxation was general, some provinces fared better than others, especially when they were safe from invasion. There was, however, one problem which was basic to Hellenistic society in general and to the later Roman Empire in particular. The cities consumed without producing. As you might guess from this well-stocked bread shop in Pompeii, the cities ate up what the countryside produced and they left little for the peasants who grew increasingly desperate. This situation became more serious as barbarian pressure increased and with it, economic pressure on the countryside became harder and harder to bear. The imperial administration was always concerned with keeping the big city population happy because it was more volatile and prone to riot. So the government offered what the Roman poet Juvenal called bread and circuses races, shows, games, displays of every sort, which had once offered occasional entertainment, now became an organic necessity. 
The symbol of all this was the Colosseum, which had been built in the first century. It could hold up to 50,000 people, and it seldom stood empty. Under the Republic, there had been 65 days of games a year. Their number increased steadily until by the 4th century they took up 175 days, half the year. The circus is their temple, said a contemporary observer. The Christians tried to put an end to gladiatorial combat, which declined after the 5th century. But chariot races and shows and bear baiting continued and pantomimes, the more obscene, the better. And though the church tried to restrain the passion, the crowds got their kicks by demanding a high degree of bloody realism so that the actor who played Hercules in a show would really be burnt at the end, and a mime would be crucified and left to die. Only total ruin puts an end to the games in the sixth century. The bread, however, ran out long before the circuses. It, too, had changed from an occasional handout to a regular aspect of public assistance designed to mollify the urban crowd. There was free wine, free grain, oil, bacon, even money. There might be handouts equivalent to 10 or 15 or even $20 to 300,000 people or more. If the state was going to pay for all this, someone had to pay the state. Obviously, that would be the provinces, the producers, the rural population. This led to growing resentment of all those greedy, useless mouths in the city, or else it meant an attempt to join the useless mouths, who at least had some fun, to become a consumer rather than a producer. And this, of course, meant fewer producers and still more problems. The cost of large-scale public assistance did not matter so much when the economy was reasonably stable. But when it was disrupted by civil war after the second century and by foreign invasions after the third, such burdens became serious. As the economy began to crack in the second and third century, the emperors concentrated on squeezing all the money and the goods they could in order to pay the army or else to pay the barbarians whom the army no longer held in check. Now this meant that the economy entered a vicious downward spiral and society with it. There were ever heavier taxes, ever fewer people capable of paying taxes. Inflation and debasement of the currency drove gold and silver out of circulation. Taxes were increasingly paid in kind, in grain, in cattle, in forced labor, or else they weren't paid at all. The economy, which had taken centuries to shift from barter to cash, slipped back to the primitive level of barter. And so this was another factor in the decline of Rome. The principal cause of ruin, however, was probably hypertrophy, growing too big, which is the essential sickness of every ancient empire. A state grows, it eliminates one threat after another, it gobbles up competitors, and after a while, the sheer cost of army and administration proves too much for the economy. Communications break down under the strain. Distant armies cannot be commanded from the center, and distant provinces break off. In the 280s, the Emperor Diocletian realized what was happening. 
he took a co-emperor who could look after the eastern part of the empire while he looked after the west. And then each of the two emperors took a vice emperor. So the administration of the empire was split into four. The future emperor Constantine was the son of one of these vice emperors. Constantine inherited his place in this tetrarchy or government by quartet. You can still see a statue of the Tetrarchs anxiously clinging to each other, which makes them look very chummy and more like medieval knights than Romans. The quartet did not last, but the duet did. The system of one empire with two emperors survived until the last emperor of the West, Romulus Augustulus, was deposed by barbarians in 476. In the Eastern Empire, Constantine took the old Greek city of Byzantium on the Bosphorus. He enlarged it. He renamed it Constantinople and made it his capital in 330. Even so, the problems of scale would not go away. They had been manageable in peacetime, but they proved overwhelming when war became endemic in the 4th and 5th centuries. Finally and inescapably, there was the economic problem. And what we can say about Rome from scenes like this one applies more or less to every society up to the 15th or 16th century. And that is that every central power and every imperial court was not a producer, but a consumer. A great city like Alexandria, Antioch, Rome was an octopus with great tentacles reaching out to suck the substance of its hinterland or of the provinces. The cities created very little in terms of material riches. Buying power was low even in the great cities. Ordinary people lived crowded in narrow quarters, cramped, unheated, barely lighted by a small oil lamp, hardly furnished at all. They spent as little time as possible in these unattractive holes, and when they weren't working, they were in the street, in the forum, in the theater or circus or the baths, which were practically free. So great as the empire was, it was economically anemic. There was little industrial production. There was little investment in enterprises that would increase the quantity of available goods and money and set them circulating. And this is one of the great differences between ancient and modern economies. Ancient capital, unlike modern capital, went either into buying land or else into usury, which is the lending out of money at extremely high interest rates. And there was little interest in new possibilities for technological change because production was generally limited to domestic economy, to what an individual home or estate needed or else to luxury goods. Let me give you an example. About 2,000 years ago, an Alexandrian geometrician named Hero invented a steam engine which was perfectly practical and which embodied the principles of the turbine and of jet propulsion. But the point about the engine is not that he invented it, but that nobody used it. What made Hero well known was that he invented a lot of tricks and toys that could amuse rich people or serve the temple priests, like a contraption that produced steam in order to open temple doors so that the gods inside would be revealed without any human intervention. But none of this led to more practical applications. 
There were, of course, plenty of slaves. And in any case, mechanics were not respectable, just as working with your hands wasn't respectable, which you can understand when you think that slaves and poor folk did it. At any rate, nobody paid much attention to science in general and to technology in particular, except for warfare and for civil engineering. Aqueducts, sewers, public buildings, ingenious ways of heating baths, all of which were very advanced, very impressive, but not terribly productive. And so the ancients reached the threshold of an industrial age, but they never crossed it. The world had to wait 1,700 years after Hero to get a steam engine and all the joys that go with it, which is not meant to suggest that the society was bad, but just that it wasn't flexible. It was not structured or equipped to adjust, to expand its means to the scale of its needs. And so when it had to adjust, all it could think of was to try to freeze things in place or to make them worse, tax more, control more, enforce and coerce and restrain as we shall see next time. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.